Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn and Alice Bryant. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Brian Lynn. European aircraft maker Airbus has announced it will stop making the world's largest passenger airplane. The French-based manufacturer said Thursday it plans to stop making the Airbus A380 in 2021. The A380 made its first test flight in 2005 and began carrying passengers two years later. The A380 is the largest commercial airplane operating today. The plane has two full levels of seating and normally is equipped to carry at least 500 people. The announcement came after the company experienced major drops in demand and sales of its A380 in recent years. In the latest decision, Emirates, Airbus's largest buyer of the A380, chose to cut the number of aircraft it had already ordered. Airbus officials said Emirates' decision left the company with no order backlog to support continued production of the plane. Airbus chief Tom Enders said the decision to end the A380 program was a painful one. We've invested a lot of effort, a lot of resources, a lot of sweat, but we need to be realistic. The decision could affect up to 3,500 jobs. It already cost Airbus about $523 million in losses in 2018, the company said. Airbus said it would enter talks with labor unions in coming weeks over jobs that could be affected. Most of the positions at risk are in France and Germany, but workers in Spain and Britain also could be affected. In a statement, the head of Emirates said the airline had been a strong supporter of the A380 from the beginning. It said the plane had become a favorite among many passengers and crew members. The decision to cancel the orders marked the reality of the current situation, the statement said. Emirates said it had reached a new $21.4 billion deal with Airbus to replace some of the A380 orders with A350 wide bodies and smaller A330 planes. I'm Brian Lynn. For years, Pak i Sil either ate too little or too much as she worked toward her dream of becoming a fashion model. But she is not tall enough or thin enough to be a model in usual fashion shows. And she is not big enough to be considered a plus-size model. Park believed that the only way to meet South Korea's beauty ideals was for her to deny who she truly is. In South Korea, a woman weighing over 50 kilograms 
is considered by many to be big, no matter how tall she is. Park herself weighs 62 kilograms. She is 165 centimeters tall. That is far from the ideal model body of 170 centimeters in height and 40 to 48 kilograms in weight. Puck, who is 25, has decided to call herself a natural size model. She defines it as a model with the same kind of body you see in daily life, as opposed to a difficult to reach ideal. She has started a YouTube channel where she introduces styles for women who look more like her than the models in magazines. Pock said, I used to think that my fat body wasn't the real me and that living in such a body wasn't my real life. I kept denying myself. I believed that my life would only become happy after I lost weight. She added, I've come to think that I look good enough just the way I am. Son Hee Chong is a researcher at the Institute of Gender Studies at Yonsei University in Seoul. She says more women are now willing to challenge societal demands of their looks. Cha Ji Won is an example. The 24-year-old runs a YouTube channel called Korean Women. She publishes videos of her daily life. She wears comfortable clothes and does not worry about her hair or makeup. Cha says she eats whatever she wants and does not think about how much fat she is eating. Cha told the Associated Press, I hoped that by letting other women know that there is someone like me, I could remind them that they don't have to care too much and spend so much money and time on their appearance. Hong is an 18-year-old high school student. She recently objected to a series of classes at her all-girls school. The classes included makeup for college freshmen, fashion styling for college freshmen, and how to make a healthy body figure. The classes were removed after Hong and other students told reporters about them. A 2015 Gallup Korea report found that about one-third of South Korean women between the ages of 19 and 29 said they had had plastic surgery procedures to change their physical appearance. Park Jia hyun works at Cosmopolitan Korea, a popular fashion magazine. She said, I think South Korean women want to look perfect. She added, they believe they should have a nice body and skin, beautiful eyes, nose and mouth, and even sleek hair with a perfect hairline. But Pak says rising feminist movements and changing values are redirecting how beauty is presented. In its December issue, Cosmopolitan Korea put a popular South Korean comedian, Lee Yong-ja, on the cover. Lee is larger than most of the models the magazine has put on its cover but changes are still slow to reach professional workplaces. A 2018 employment survey from the Korean company Saramin found that female job seekers are often judged more for their looks than male job seekers. The middle of February is winter here in Washington, D.C. I walked outside this morning and the temperature was below freezing. 
and I made the mistake of wearing light clothing. So I went back in the house and put on a sweater under my coat. The words under and below are close in meaning. They are also similar to the words beneath and underneath. All of them can act as prepositions or adverbs. I will have more on that shortly. So, if all four words are similar, how do we know which word to use? In our program today, we will answer that. First, I have some good news. The word under is the most widely used of the four words and can often replace the others. If you are ever unsure which one to use, choose under. Now let's begin. The words under, below, beneath, and underneath can all mean in a lower place or position and sometimes covered by something else. Under is the most used of the three in everyday speech when talking about a lower physical position, like this. We sat under the stars and listened to the night sounds. Keeping the boxes under the bed helps to save space. Beneath differs here only in that it is more formal and less common in spoken English. But you could use it for those two examples. Underneath is often used to say that something is under and covered by something else, so you could use it for the boxes example. You could also use below, but we normally use this word for things of a similar grouping. Listen to the examples. I hung the new family photo below the old one. Please carefully read and sign the below document. In the first example, the photos are on the same wall. In the second, the document is part of an email or group of papers. Three of the words, under, below, and beneath, can also be used when identifying someone of a lower rank or with less power than someone else. The words under, beneath, and underneath can also more specifically mean covered or hidden by something. This can refer to something physically covered by another thing, or it can refer to hidden personal qualities. Listen to someone use the first meaning. I'm wearing a black sweater underneath this coat. Note that the word underneath is a preposition. It has an indirect object, this coat. And now the second. Her personality seems cold, but she's really warm underneath. Note that the word underneath comes at the end of the sentence, the most common placement when our four words today act as adverbs. Next, below and beneath can refer to people or things that are unworthy in some way or of a lower social ranking. Here's how someone might use the words. He refuses to take a job that he sees as beneath him. Some people think she married below her family. This meaning is negative, however, so exercise care when using it. Another meaning for under and below relates to measurement. It means lower than in age, number, or level. The word under is common in reference to age. It is unlawful to buy cigarettes if you are under 21 years of age. In this example, the word under is a preposition. It has an indirect object, 21 years of age. Now here it is again, but serving as an adverb. It is unlawful to buy cigarettes if you are 21 years of age or under. Now on to measurements. We usually use below when discussing such things as height and temperature. Have a listen. 
Temperatures in the Midwest fell below zero last week. A large part of New Orleans is at or below sea level. I want to quickly tell you two more meanings of the word under, since it's such a common word with a lot of meanings. It can mean guided by or managed by, as in this. The restaurant will be under new management starting in March. It can also mean in a condition or state, as in this. The shopping center is under construction until next year. Under can also be used as a prefix, a group of letters added at the beginning of a word to change its meaning. As such, it can mean below or less than an expected or correct amount and can be an adjective or a verb. Listen to the first sentence, which uses an adjective, and the second, which uses a verb. I cannot permit you to enter this club. You're underage. Oh, no. They undercooked the chicken. I can't eat it now. And lastly, under is also used in common English expressions, such as under the weather, under pressure, under the law, under arrest, and under your breath. There are many, and you don't need to memorize them. But keep in mind that expressions often cannot be understood from the meanings of their separate words. I'm Alice Bryant. Welcome to The Making of a Nation. American History in VOA Special English. The Civil War began in 1861 as a struggle over the right of states to leave the Union. President Abraham Lincoln firmly believed that a state did not have that right, and he declared war on the southern states that tried to leave. Lincoln had only one reason to fight, to save the Union. In time, however, there was another reason to fight, to free the black people held as slaves in the South. Today, Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe continue the story of how President Lincoln dealt with this issue. Lincoln had tried to keep the issue of slavery out of the war, he feared it would weaken the northern war effort. Many men throughout the North would fight to save the Union. They would not fight to free the slaves. Lincoln also needed the support of the four slave states that had not left the Union, Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, and Missouri. He could not be sure of their support, if he declared that the purpose of the war was to free the slaves. Lincoln was able to follow this policy at first, but the war to save the Union was going badly. The North had not won a decisive victory in Virginia, the heart of the Confederacy. To guarantee continued support for the war, Lincoln was forced to recognize that the issue of slavery was, in fact, a major issue. And on September 22, 1862, he announced a new policy on slavery in the rebel southern states. His announcement became known as the Emancipation Proclamation. American newspapers printed the proclamation. This is what it said. I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States and Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, do hereby declare that on the first day of January, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state then in rebellion against the United States 
shall then become and be forever free. The government of the United States, including the military and naval forces, will recognize and protect the freedom of such persons, and will interfere in no way with any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. For political reasons, the proclamation did not free slaves in the states that supported the Union, nor did it free slaves in the areas around Norfolk, Virginia, and New Orleans, Louisiana. Most anti-slavery leaders praised the Emancipation Proclamation. They had waited a long time for such a document. But some did not like it. They said it did not go far enough. It did not free all of the slaves in the United States, only those held by the rebels. Lincoln answered that the Emancipation Proclamation was a military measure. He said he made it under his wartime powers as commander-in-chief. As such, it was legal only in enemy territory. Lincoln agreed that all slaves should be freed. It was his personal opinion, but he did not believe that the Constitution gave him the power to free all the slaves. He hoped that could be done slowly during peacetime. Lincoln's new policy on slavery was welcomed warmly by the people of Europe. It won special praise in Britain. The British people were deeply concerned about the Civil War in America. The United States Navy had blocked southern exports of cotton. The British textile industry, which depended on this cotton, was almost dead. Factories were closed. Hundreds of thousands of people were out of work. The British government watched and worried as the war continued month after month. Finally, late in the summer of 1862, British leaders said the time had come for them to intervene. They would try to help settle the American dispute. Britain would propose a peace agreement based on northern recognition of southern rights. If the North rejected the agreement, Britain would recognize the Confederacy. Then came the news that President Lincoln was freeing the slaves of the South. Suddenly, the Civil War was a different war. No longer was it a struggle over Southern rights. Now it was a struggle for human freedom. The British people strongly opposed slavery. When they heard that the slaves would be freed, they gave their support immediately to President Lincoln and the North. Britain's peace proposals were never offered. The Emancipation Proclamation had cost the South the recognition of Britain and France. The South was furious over the proclamation. Southern newspapers attacked Lincoln. They accused him of trying to create a slave rebellion in states he could not occupy with troops. They also said the proclamation was an invitation for Negroes to murder whites. The Confederate Congress debated several resolutions to fight Lincoln's proclamation. One resolution would make slaves of all Negro soldiers captured from the Union Army. Another called for the execution of white officers who led black troops. Some Southern lawmakers even proposed the death sentence for anyone who spoke against slavery. In the North, 
Most people cheered the new policy on slaves. Some, however, opposed it. They said the policy would cause the slave states of the Union to secede. Those states would join the Confederacy. Or they said it would cause freed slaves to move north and take away jobs from whites. There also was another reason. 1862 was a congressional election year. The Democratic Party was the opposition party at that time. Party leaders believed their candidates would have a better chance of winning if they opposed the policy. Democrats said the policy was proof that anti-slavery extremists were in control of the government. As we said, Abraham Lincoln announced the Emancipation Proclamation on September 22, 1862. But Lincoln said he would not sign the proclamation until the first day of 1863. That gave the southern states 100 days to end their rebellion or face the destruction of slavery. Some people thought Lincoln would withdraw the proclamation at the last minute. They did not believe he would sign a measure that was so extreme. They said the new policy would only make the South fight harder, and as a result, the Civil War would last longer. Others charged that the proclamation was illegal. They said the Constitution did not give the president the power to violate the property rights of citizens. Lincoln answered the charges. He said, I think the Constitution gives the commander-in-chief special powers under the laws of war. The most that can be said, if so much, is that slaves are property. Is there any question that, by the laws of war, property, both of enemies and friends, may be taken when needed? Just before the first of the year, a congressman asked the president if he still planned to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. My mind is made up, Lincoln answered. It must be done. I am driven to it. There is no other way out of our troubles. But although my duty is clear, it is in some way painful. I hope that the people will understand that I act not in anger, but in expectation of a greater good. The morning of New Year's Day was a busy time for Lincoln. It was a tradition to open the White House on that day so the President could wish visitors a happy New Year. After the last visitor had gone, Lincoln went to his office. He started to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. Then he stopped. He said, I never in all my life felt more sure that I was doing right than I do in signing this paper. But I have been shaking hands all day until my arm is tired. When people examine this document, they will say he was not sure about that. But anyway, it is going to be done. With those words, he wrote his name at the bottom of the paper. He had issued one of the greatest documents in American history. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.